And welcome to the Halloween edition of And They're Off. No costumes, no wisecracks, but I'll give out candy if you come by the Blood Horse offices this week only. Steve Haskins, speaking of giving things out, do I have your word that you will never, ever give out another football prediction on this show? <laughs> you certainly do not. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. Yeah, I think people should uh, be a little concerned about what, what might be inside that candy. <laughs> Very good. In the original rappers. All right. <laughs> Steve, the, the Rick Dutchow case has now moved to the court system where uh, it's quite likely to reside for some time. Dutchrow was given a 10-year ban by the New York State Racing and Ra Wagering Board, and he did plenty to get himself in trouble. Repeated violations, both minor and major, doing things like showing up to a license revocation hearing without a lawyer or a defense. You know, at some point you have to pretend you're an adult. Having said that, I think the 10-year ban is excessive and will likely aid Dutro's legal case when he tries to get it overturned. If you use Patrick Biancone as a comparison, and unfortunately he has to, uh, Biancone got a year, he screwed up, he ended up getting a year and a half. I think they should have given Dutro two years on this. Every owner he has will be forced to move their horses to other trainers, and uh, after two years, Dutcher would have to come back and start from scratch, which is the whole idea. Uh, and then, of course, if he violated any term of that suspension, I'd just double it. So that's what I think. Steve, what do you got on Dutcher? Um, I have to agree with you. I mean, look, I like Rick Dutcher personally, but, you know, even he and his own brother, Tony, you know, admits that, uh, you know, throughout his life, he's played basically by his own rules, and now it's come back to, uh, to hurt him uh, big time. But, uh, you know, you got major drug violators in the sport now getting six-month suspensions, and to me, it's quite a leap to 10 years. Now, I know it's a cumulative thing, yeah. and they're trying to make a statement because of all, because of all his uh, past transgressions. Uh, adding them up over the years, and I think they want to look good, you know, to the animal activists, which is all fine. But still, I mean, 10 years in racing is pretty much a death sentence, yeah. and you really want to do that. You know, the one thing about Rick Dutro is that he is a, a, a very good trainer, and his horses get taken care of as well as any, as well as any other horses. Yeah. I mean, two, two, year, two years is a long time. Yeah, it is. So. And clearly this is based on, on the whole rap sheet, and, and it really shouldn't be. I mean, the, the, the suspension should be based on the violation currently under investigation and not, not based on the, on the career history, which, uh, of course, it's tough to, to separate, but I, I don't think that's right. Um, all right, Steve, I don't see how racing can move forward if we don't find an answer to, to these constant injuries that horses suffer. It's getting worse than football, even though there's no contact here. Uh, we've seen in the last few days recently retired flashpoints, twirling candy, blind luck. Yeah, I know, but believe me, she's retired. And uh, not retired, but out of the Breeders' Cup in the last few days, Zazu, awesome gem, sassy image, currency swap. Who knows what's going to happen here in the next week or two. Steve, is this a weakness of the breed of thoroughbred that we have? Is it, is it indicative of too much racing and too much training? Uh, what's the answer here? Yes, we do have this problem, and it's, it always seems to center around the Kentucky Derby and the Breeders' Cup. Yeah, it now, does. The thing with, yeah. Now, yeah, well, the thing with the, with the Derby is that horses are now being, being rushed to make the Derby. Yeah. And, and they're ill-prepared to run in that race. And so when you take these lightly raced horses and try to get to the Derby, you're going to have more injuries. It's not the way it used to be. Horses used to go into the Derby with 8, 9, 10, 12, 13 starts under them. Now they go in with 3, 4, and 5 starts. And I think that, uh, I think that escalates the injury. As far as the, the Breeders' Cup, I think the fact that these injuries are being escalated is the fact that we've got 15 races now as compared to to eight races just a few years ago. So you know, you're dealing with 70 to 80 more horses than we used to. When yeah. you're dealing with that many more horses, you're gonna have more likely uh, yeah. uh, more, more injuries. 
So yeah. I think that's 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 the problem there. And you also have to remember that the Breeders' Cup comes at the end of the yeah. year yes. when the horses have the, there's more wear and tear on these horses <laughs> yeah. th throughout the year. And it's you know you're talking October and November, but I think uh, the main part is it's a little deceiving because of the fact that we have so many more horses running in the Breeders' Cup now. So it's it's logical yeah. that more of them are going to be hurt. As far as what you said, you know, is the breed weakened? Compared to 30, 40 years ago, uh, definitely it's, uh, it's, it's been weakened. Uh, speaking of the Breeders' Cup, our Breeders' Cup show will be next week, but that won't stop us right now from giving you viewers the top 10 things most likely to happen at this year's Breeders' Cup. Top 10 things most likely to happen. Steve, get us going here. Okay, number 10. Any jockey who cuts off Calvin Burrell in a race will receive a police escort the rest of the day. <laughs> and boxing gloves, probably. <laughs> yes, definitely. The number nine thing uh, most likely to happen, American horses in the Breeders' Cup turf will once again perform like it's illegal to run on grass. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which is a really an unfortunate statement. But um, number eight, Ken Ramsey will run so many kittens the track crew will be cleaning up hairballs after the races. <laughs> Number seven, the first jockey on horseback who talks to a TV announcer will be flogged with his own whip by the stewards, but not more than five times. <laughs> yes, that's, that's going to come up, uh, I think, several times, but... Um... Uh, number six, Hav de Grasse will be the most mispronounced name in Breeders' Cup history. Uh, let's see. We're gonna hit, what are we going to hear? We're going to hear Havre de Grace. We're going to hear Havre de Grasse. Havre de Gras. Havre de Grace. I mean, it's going to be all over the place. JJ but I, th I think you get the picture. Her owner doesn't know how to pronounce her name. <laughs> number five thing to happen at the Breeders' Cup. As nighttime temperatures plunge, Shivering fans will derisively bring up Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think, uh, I, think he, I think he'll be cursed. Him and global warming will be a topic of conversation as everybody sits there freezing on a Friday night. Night. I emphasize the word night. Anyway, we won't get into that. Number four, the winner of the new Breeders' Cup Juvenile Sprint will go on to win the 2012 Kentucky Derby, equaling the number of Breeders' Cup juvenile winners to win the Derby. Oh. So that, 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 that says a lot. That's a statement. All right. Number three thing most likely to happen. After seeing the ladies' classic field, Zenyatta will enter herself and win while seven months pregnant. <laughs> I, I'll listen. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. uh, number two. John Veach will scratch any horse who doesn't run into the starting <laughs> gate. <laughs> and the number one thing most likely to happen at this year's Breeders' Cup, Ashton Kutcher will be named to replace Rick Dutrow. There, <laughs> there you have it. The top ten things. Keep that checklist handy. Let's see how many of them come true. I, I bet a couple of them. Uh, <laughs> Steve, talk about talent leaving the racetrack as we just were. Get a load of this list of fillies and mares being sold at Keeneland and Fazek Tipton in November. And this is just a very partial list. Sassy Image, St. Trinian's, Blind Luck, Summer Soiree, Turbulent Ascent, Zoftig, Ask the Moon, AZ Warrior, Crisp, CS Silk, Funny Moon, Hilda's Passion, Malibu Pier, More Than Real, Switch, Buster's Ready, Life at Ten, Malibu Prayer, Marum, Necessary Evil, Negligee, Raging Fever, Ticker Tape, Unrivaled Bell, Delta Princess, and many, many more. There's an awful lot of talent there, Steve. <laughs> uh, yeah, good grief. I mean, I wish we had half those horses in this year's uh, Breeders' Cup. Yeah. But you know what? You mentioned you mentioned Life at Ten, and yeah. I'm just I'm just trying to picture. Wouldn't it be funny if Life at Ten came charging into the ring and began rearing and bucking <laughs> and was like totally full of herself, and, like uncontrollable? I mean, that would. Yeah. Uh, I'm just. Envi I can only envision that come Breeders' Cup time. <laughs> She's feeling good for this one, anyway. All right. 
This coming Friday, October 28th, there's an independent um, film coming out about a down and out thoroughbred trainer. It's titled, ironically, and they're off. <laughs> so after looking into whether we could sue them or not, uh, we decided to make nice. And uh, joining us uh, today to discuss his and they're off on our and they're off is the star of the movie, Sean Astin. Sean, are you confused yet? Uh, no, I'm just waiting for the audience to have their end there off. Hey, hey, Sean, if you've had a lot of experience with horses, but, uh, you know, these thoroughbreds, they're beautiful, but they can be awful big and intimidating. How was it uh, for you working around them uh, during the shooting? Um, we had some great trainers that took good care of us, and, and uh, some of the horses that we're using, some of the thoroughbreds had also been used on other, uh, one was on Seabiscuit, one played Seabiscuit, and another one. So we, we felt pretty good. I got up on one to do a photo, a little photo call with Sherry O'Terry, uh, and uh, we rode it around, and, the, you know, they are, they're like a fighter jet. You know, you just move it just a little bit this way, and they go, and, and that, the, it, is, it is scary to me. It's, it's very, it's fun, it's exciting, but it's also, if you, you know, their power must be respected. Now, did the horse that was in Seabiscuit, did he have an attitude about playing comedy now, or was he okay? <laughs> well, all I can say is his agent was right off to the side, you know, all the time, you know, kind of hawking us. Listen, you only got 20 more minutes. Get him out of here. Come on. He's got a yeah. yeah, he's got a commercial uh, coming up. Hey, Sean, in, uh, in Hollywood's golden age way back then, uh, there were people like Sinatra and Liz Taylor and Bing Crosby who, who went out to the races all the time. Uh, do you or any of your friends uh, friends in, in Hollywood, uh, do you make, does, does any of those guys make it a stop along the way to go to Santa Anita or Del Mar? I know we have, um, Alex Rocco does a little bit in the movie, uh -huh. the actor, and, and uh, who's uh, amazing and, and kind of is of that, gen that Sinatra generation, you know, and, uh, and he, we sat talking and his knowledge of, yeah. of the horses was really kind of incredible and, and uh, so I think that's getting passed down. It, it's, yeah. it, of course it is. It has to be. It's too, it's too cool for it not to be. Yeah, we'd love for it to be hip again somehow because uh, we really need that infusion of youth into it. And, uh, you know, hopefully this movie will go a ways toward doing that because we just need to get it out there. I mean, I love horse racing. I, I've, you know, watched them and bet on them and enjoyed them and, you know, met horses and, you know, ridden a little bit and like that. You know, everybody knows about jockeys and the world of jockeys. And, but I don't think people really know that very much about the trainers so we've done this this character i play this character he's just so terrible he's just a terrible trainer <laughs> and every time he talks about stuff it's it's wrong <laughs> and you you know you just you sort of it's fun to just watch this guy fail over and over again i'm in don't you need him to turn around no nah. this is exactly the view that all of his rivals will have why would i need to see anything more <laughs> and yet somehow as you're doing that it's orienting you to like what, what the right thing is. Uh -huh. It's kind of wanting to see it. Yeah. And so, if I, if, to me, if you watch this movie and you go to the races afterwards, you don't know anything about it. You're not just going to be looking for the horses and their numbers and their and their stats. You're going to be like, oh, who trains them? You know, who? Uh -huh. who I wonder. So I think that's a that's a good thing. I, I'm proud yeah. to sort of support the the sport a little like that. Yeah. For, for our viewers who may not know it, Sean uh, is the son of very famous parents, the great actress Patty Duke, whose show I watched incessantly when I was growing up, and uh, of course John Astin, who portrayed uh, one of the greatest characters in TV history. Sean, I know you're considerably younger than I am, but uh, I, I just wanted to ask you, as you... I'm sure growing up or watching tapes of the Adams family, did you recognize the absolute genius that John Aston brought to Gomez? Well, we would, he had a 16 millimeter projector and we were, I mean, you're talking about the late seventies when I was watching the stuff. Uh -huh. and we would sit in the living room and we'd play it, you know, with the screen in front of us, the actual, you know, t screen that you pull up and then we'd play it backwards. <laughs> So, you know, he'd do a scene where he goes flying into the coat of arms, you know, into the, in, the, in the hallway, and then we'd back it up so he comes flying back out of the coat of arms, and then back into the coat of arms, and then back out of the coat of arms. And, uh, you know, his, his eyes, his very expressive yeah. eyes. And, but, you know, he was blowing up trains and being, you know, yeah. toy, toy trains. He was 
our goofy dad. You know, he yeah. was our goofy dad, and the fact that everyone else got to experience that with him too made us happy. You yeah, know? yeah. Sean, we appreciate you joining us Friday, October 28th, and their off opens at selected theaters. I know there's some in LA, there's some in New York, there's certainly some in Kentucky where it's playing, so go on out and see it. And uh, Sean, we here at And They're Off, we want to be included in the sequel, if that's okay. And they're off. You're definitely in the sequel, no question about it. Sean, thanks a ton for joining us today. We thanks, appreciate buddy. it. I really appreciate it uh, being on the show. All right. Stable Boy, will you be going to see uh, And They're Off when it, when it comes out? I, I don't know. Does it, uh, is it going to come into theaters around here? Yes, it's opening in Lexington and Louisville, as a matter of fact. Well, uh, we'll, we'll have to go together. Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah, just <laughs> uh, f uh, tell go me on it. Facebook so, so you can defriend me again. All right. We want to thank our viewers. We want to thank our sponsor, Darby Dan Farm. Remind you that we're coming right back at you next week, Wednesday, November 2nd. Steve and I will be live on tape from the Breeders' Cup at Churchill Downs. Do not miss that one. Steve, have a good trip, and we will see you here in Kentucky. Thank you. Look forward to it. A rare, Bye, everyone. A rare plane trip for Steve. Yes. Okay. No, very no good. driving this time. Okay. Bye bye, everybody. Bye.